Hello, I'm Ron Edwards with ChineseEconomicHistory.com, and we're here at the World Economic History Congress in Kyoto, Japan. And uh, we're using this opportunity to uh, interview prominent Chinese economic historians. And today we're lucky to have Professor William Guangling Liu. He is, has a PhD from Harvard University and is an associate professor at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. His area of expertise is Chinese uh, economic history of the Song Dynasty, and he's somewhat of a rising star uh, in, this, in this field. Um, he's published several papers and, and uh, a book in the two books uh, coming, and today we're going to talk a little bit about those and uh, hear his views on these uh, important topics. Uh, but first, at ChineseEconomicHistory.com, we typically ask some questions. Uh, of interest to the uh, to our to our viewers, economists in the United States and in, in, in Europe, um, there's a general view uh, among growth and development economists that the world and many countries, if not most countries, experienced roughly st constant standards of living and population, or slightly increasing, and then. Uh, late in the game, uh, in the last century or so, experienced economic growth by increasing living standards and population. Uh, do you feel China, um, uh, China's economic development path followed this Western economic path? No, no, it didn't. Okay. Um, uh, so maybe f f filling in the, this, uh, this whole... Uh, do you view, view that Song China experienced economic growth where uh, that is living standards increase, population increase, and also market expansion uh, increased during the Song Dynasty? Uh, yes, no problem. Uh, is, no, it's you, a good case for uh, pre-industrial economic growth in terms of uh, population growth, uh, market expansion, and the improvement in the living standard for the majority of the population. Okay, very good. Thank you. And uh, lastly, uh, just more generally, what's the general view of uh, China's economic performance during the Song Dynasty of Song experts in the West? Oh, it's now a controversial issue. At the beginning, the Song experts were confident uh, about defining the Song pattern as uh, one of uh, economic growth. Mm -hmm. Then this view came under attack, and uh, and they were asked to provide for provide more quantitative and uh, systematic evidence for such argument. Mm -hmm. And things become complicated. Um, the whole issue. It become you know the conclusion such conclusion became unstable and they feel uncertain much more uncertain. Mm -hmm. um, but personally, I disagree with this uh, this change. And why is that? Uh, because I think the evidence is there. You just need to make effort to find evidence. I see. And uh, what type of what type of is is this? Uh I mean, I mean, I mean the yes. I mean the macroeconomic uh, data. I see the quantitative yeah. macroeconomic data. So yeah, you know. yes, that is to support uh, you know the so-called uh, pre-industrial growth in I the see. 11 and the, and the 10th and 11th century China. And then, and as I understand it, it's uh, this is part. This is part of your book that, that we'll be talking about yes. here in a moment. Also, uh, uh, in debating, I've, I've known many economic historians who have talked about the pre-1500 period, and um, to demand modern quantitative uh, standards uh, uh, for periods a thousand years ago is a bit unreasonable. Uh, it, it, no. it's, it's almost impossible uh, to find a country that has systematic GDP accounts and other things that uh, qualitative evidence and the best quantitative evidence that we can find should be put together. Um, 
but anyway, I think uh, that's the, my own view on, uh, on the case. And uh, I'm happy to hear that there's quantitative uh, macro data. That mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to, to hearing about that. Um, so lastly, uh, before we get on to your book, you have a very interesting paper uh, recently published, I believe, in the uh, Economic History Review. Uh, and the title of it is The Making of the Early Modern Fiscal State in Song, China. Could you tell us a, a little bit about the, your, the key points of this paper? Uh, it's basically talk about the relationship between uh, military development, state capacity, and market expansion in Song, China. Uh, this is a very important pattern, right, that the historian, Adam historian, used to account for the success of European power uh, in the 18th and 19th century. They are traced back to the, uh, st the strong connection between the military, finance, and the market. Mm -hmm. And uh, they thought it unique for European history only, early modern European history only. I see. Um, surprisingly, I found the same, the same pattern existed in 10th and 11th century China. We see a very formal cooperation between the merchants and the governments in certain key areas of economic activities, especially like the long distance trade, of tea and salt, uh, urban consumption like the alcohol, uh, alcohol monopoly. And, and the, the state was under heavy pressure to develop very sophisticated state apparatus to aid military defense. And they were even driven to invent certain fantastic uh, credit tools. So there are new credit institutions by yes. the, the government in the 10th and 11th century. Yes. I yeah. see. This sounds, uh, it's not, but it sounds a bit like the, the, the Bank of England, but a less stable one. Yeah, the early stage, yeah. I see. Um, now when the Mongols came in and put it into the, the, the Song Dynasty, did this, uh, uh, these institutions never reappear in China? Uh, no. And when it came to the later 19th century, Mm -hmm. uh, after the arrival of the European imperialism, they used the gunpowder, the warfare, all these things. Uh, the European countries defeated the, the, Chinese, the, Chi the Chinese power, the, Chi the Chinese state, um, and forced the, Chi the political elite in China to launch the financial reform to wage wars you know, improve their military technology in competition with the West. And uh, under such circumstances, they were forced to tax the market, to raise money from the merchants, uh, to develop public debts, central banking, all these things. They believe they will learn from the West. Nothing, you know, no such thing happened in Chinese history, but they were wrong. Those things already happened in the 11th and 12th century China. Wow. So they, they forgot their own, their own experiences. So to speak. Yes. Uh, this reminds me of uh, uh, the history of mathematics in, in China. In the Song Yan period, uh, there was a flourishing of extremely high and sophisticated mm -hmm. mathematics. Yeah. And they forgot about it until uh, Matteo Rizzi came in and introduced uh, uh, mathematics again. They thought they were learning things from Matteo Rizzi, but they had forgotten uh, uh, the mathematics of the Song and Yuan period. Uh, uh, many things seem to follow this pattern. Um, okay, well let's let's move on to your book. This is uh, the most interesting part. I I, I like uh, in my own interest. Um, your book, uh, The Chinese Market Economy, 1000 to 1500, uh, it's, uh, it's published by uh, SUNY, uh, SUNY Press, and you can buy it now, uh, as of the end of last month, I understand. Uh, so uh, can you please tell us a, a bit about your book and uh, the, uh, particularly the, um, 
the evidence that uh, you, you, you've mentioned that kind of uh, swings this debate about uh, the question of the West, in the West, among Song experts of growth in China? Sure. Um, you know, everyone understands that there is a tremendous, tremendous difficulties to study uh, Asian market or the finance in pre-industrial times, right? You have uh, you face a challenge, you know, uh, not only theoretical framework like how to understand people in the past, but the, you also face, you know, the lacking of qualified uh, primary sources, uh, economic data, so to speak, the raw data. Quantified. Quantified, yeah. Um, luckily, the case why you know began to collect uh, primary sources, I found that luckily um, we can beat these two challenges because uh, first, uh, the Song state was different from other dynasties in Chinese history. It developed a unique perception of how market work because it has a, its incentive. Well, it, it tax the market, right? Yes, so it has such needs. You pay attention. And uh, secondly, there's a uh, on very special occasion. Uh, there's uh, one set of the macro level quantitative data was preserved in a book, namely uh, Zhong Su Bei Dei. That book disappeared uh, in the Ming for a period. Wow. But then people found it in the 19th century from the Zhongle Dadian. And they made a copy. So that's, we are fortunate, right? To use that uh, uh, really invaluable materials to reconstruct the, you know, every aspect of the market economy in 11th century China, especially the years around uh, 1077. I see. So uh, Japanese and, and, and Chinese scholars in mainland China uh, have not used this source of data to buttress their opinions of uh, their arguments <laughs> well, you of, know, of, of growth? Yeah. It sounds like it's something totally new <laughs> or, at least, or at least being used uh, in a new way. Uh, you know, this, uh, this is a tradition in our field, the Chinese economic history, right? People used to think uh, the later the period, uh, the better the, the primary sources and the more chance you can find the quantitative evidence. Yes. Right? Because uh, history records became much more detailed. Right? That's very common wisdom. Uh, but as I just told before, here is the two conditions. The state, the you know, state perception and the preservation. Uh, actually, I find state perception matters much than the second criteria. And if we uh, talk about the Chinese economic history field, so, most scholars would are trained in the study of later period. So I'm sorry, by, by state perception, you mean basically the, the attention the state gave uh, the market. To, to the market and the yeah. attention that it focused and the records that it kept. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But the later on, the, the, the Chinese state lost that perception. Mm -hmm. So even we have a much, much more records, you know, in terms of quantity, uh, we find in the later centuries, say 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, mm -hmm. uh, they bear no relation to the real actual performance um, of the actual performance of the market. I see. So people really got uh, uh, got Inco discouraged. They they stopped there. They did not, you know, look back further. And I'm lucky. I just, you know, by chance, I find oh, that's possible. Mm -hmm. So basically, the the Song Dynasty uh, economic records that, that were preserved by the state are, in, in some sense, uh, at least better than some if not many of the uh, Ming and Qing uh, uh, dynasty records, precisely because 
the uh, central government is using excise taxes to collect yes, and things exactly, like this. Yes, exactly. And it was not head taxes. And, and remember, and, that's 11th 11, 11 and 12th century. Yes. Actually, that's the best uh, document, quantitative evidence we can find for all the state sovereignty state power in the world. I see. Yeah. Well, um, the one thing that would jump to my uh, mind, and I think other people's, was if this growth was going on in the, in the Song China and they were keeping uh, such records, uh, why did it not continue into the, the subsequent dynasties? Um, well, one convenient answer is uh, the tax from the market became less and less significant. So the government lost the interest. They never train experts you know, in admi administering such a field. And uh, you know, still the, the government is just like a student. If you stop the training, for example, in mathematics for a couple of decades, it's probably difficult for you to pick up it. At least you need a re re be returned again, right? Now, are, are you talking, uh, would you say this is especially true with excise taxes, taxes on commerce? Yes. Okay, and so they still did have some land taxes, land, so yeah, re, these re, things yeah. based on registers, but yeah. the, the commercial taxes or the excise taxes is, is similar to the English case. Yeah. Uh, this did not persist. Yeah, that's a very, you make a very important po uh, point that, you know, this, uh, I find the striking similarity between 18th century Britain and 11th century China in a case, they all rely on the taxation. Of excise taxes. Yeah, the monopoly of alcohol. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. That's at the urban side. So this, uh, you did see the connection between wireless and alcoholism. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was I was speaking with a colleague last night, and and uh, he mentioned when he went to the the uh, National Palace Museum in, mm -hmm. in uh, next to Tiananmen Square, yeah. he saw these very large vats of mm -hmm. uh, uh, for, for rice wine, mm -hmm. and I, and uh, I know from studying this that these were often used during the Song Dynasty yeah. Yeah. Uh, in restaurants and, and major things that. Yeah. And, and the British tended to uh, tax beer. Yeah, yeah. So uh, in in both cases, it seems that economic growth led, I don't want to say alcoholism, <laughs> but at least <laughs> increased alcoholic consumption in Absolutely. some sense in two cases. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I see. So, uh, were there any in, in terms of not just the commercial taxes or the or the commercial the, the general uh, increase in living standards and uh, was there any other reason why in the Ming or uh, Qing dynasty that you could point to that was kind of a turning point that mm -hmm. that slowed down this uh, growth uh, economic growth of the the Song dynasty. Um, you know, scholars already talked uh, a lot about uh, change and the continuity um, before and after the Mongol conquest. Yes. And uh, it's still, um, it's, you know, it's still a debating issue among scholars. We are far from reaching um, a conclusion, yeah, so to speak. Uh, but. At least one thing I think it's very important and it's easier to make a comparison uh, is uh, after Mongol conquest, you know, you see the legitimacy of the of the Mongolian imperialism. Uh, you have some Ming Qing, uh, what I like to name it as the Beijing imperialism. Mm -hmm. uh, their impact on the on the Chinese economy especially the structure of the economic structure, is uh, increasing tension between territory expansion and the market integration. The China uh, get bigger, the more difficult to integrate the domestic market. I see. Yeah. And were there uh, any changes at the beginning of, the, of this period that were notable, uh, the, the, the early Ming Dynasty? Were there, were there changes that uh, had? Oh, sure. Uh, there is a, 
radical change occurred at the early Ming period. Radical change. Yes. Okay. That uh, led a sharp decline in the living standard. Mm -hmm. And uh, that cause is a state intervention. And it's not the common pattern of the state intervention. I like to call it the early Ming command economy. Command economy. Uh, yes, the emperor actually used all the possible means, some even unexpected uh, from our point of view, to plan, to manage the life of the farmers, millions and millions of farmers. Wow. They try to, you know, this, it's, it's what I call, the, you know, the, the real meaning of the uh, command economy, because command economy must be planned. Yes. Uh, they basically, they built up the Lijia system, which require every farmer, you know, be registered into a, a small social unit. And based on that regist household registration, once you're assigned a post, it's a hereditary. Mm -hmm. uh, your son will, you know, continue to work on that. If a farmer, then the son is a farmer as well. If, a, if it's a, you know, craftsman, then be a craftsman. If a soldier, then it's a soldier. Uh, more than that, they also, you know, uh, forced people move to the depopulation area in North China and the Central China, Sichuan, all the places. This account for uh, nearly 20% of the Chinese agricultural population. And the well, uh, so you're saying that the founding, the founding Ming emperor yes. actually forcibly moved 20% of China's population to the... Uh, uh, Depopulation area. To, that on the frontier. Frontier and the inland. And oh, the inland. You, you have the North China and the large frontier not occupied and uh, you know cultivated uh, land. Yeah, left with all the wastelands. I see. Yeah, so the emperor used all the non-monetary means, and in many times it's coercive to force people work there without access to market. And sometimes, and. The, it's very typically, they even do not have the farming tools and the drafting animal. Were these self-sufficient units or did they have, did they have, yes. did they have a, a small uh, local market economy? Uh, well, if you check the historical record, the, the magistrate report record say, you know, after a decade long uh, working hard, finally we set up a, a market for the whole county, mm -hmm. just at the county seat. A county, yeah, but nothing like a national market in, in the Song uh, Dynasty. No, no, it's a no. It was in the Song Dynasty in the 11th century. You see, uh, everywhere you find you know this uh, rural market town, and also you find the inter-regional trade facilitated by the canal. It's it's a thousands of long canal in construction. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not only Grand Canal. We, f we are familiar with the later Ming and the Qing Dynasty. We talk about the canal, it we mean the Grand Canal. Yeah, but the, the Song Dynasty, the statesman constructed a large number of canals to link the, uh, the cities in, the, in four directions. Just, you know, to facilitate the water transportation and also benefit them, benefit the officials to collect, to tax trade. And, and this is in the Song Dynasty? Yes, this is in the 11th century China. Okay. Well, this sounds very interesting. Um, based on the series of interviews that uh, I've conducted here in the last uh, several days among uh, Song Dynasty experts from uh, Japan and also uh, uh, from mainland China, uh, there's a general consensus that there was economic growth uh, in terms of living standards and mm -hmm. population, uh, according to the, these scholars' view and their impressions of this. But it's also interesting that in the United States, uh, the quantification of economic history has taken the greatest hold uh, mm -hmm. uh, of these areas. So in some sense, it's not so surprising that cleometrics and other things have demanded 
quantitative data in order to support these because I believe that the, uh, the Song Dynasty experts uh, in the Far East were a bit more willing to look at qualitative evidence. And I look very much forward to your book because uh, the addition of this new data uh, and, and also hopefully the uh, presentation of qualitative evidence will uh, stimulate a debate uh, in, in, on the Song Dynasty in the United States and, and Western Europe because of, uh, especially in the United States, because of the emphasis on the quantitative data. So it sounds like new sets of quantitative data have come out. The quality is better than any other quantitative data of its time. And um, it sounds like a potentially uh, quite influential book. So uh, uh, this book in particular, I would encourage uh, people who are interested in the Song Dynasty uh, and its quantitative uh, evidence in, in terms of uh, helping us determine uh, whether or not there was economic growth by these standards, uh, to take a look at uh, Professor uh, William Guanglin Guang Liu's book. Uh, again, he's, he's pretty much considered a young rising star in the Song Dynasty uh, in, in, in this field. And uh, we look forward to, to uh, taking a look at your book. So uh, thank you for ha having us uh, over for uh, an interview and thank you for your time. Thank you and, and welcome to join the Song History Research. Okay, and uh, enjoy your time here at the, at the conference. Thank you. Thank you.